Hello lovely people! Welcome to the first one of my series that is going to be me reading all of my friends' favourite books and then talking to you about them. This is a video trend that I've seen all over the place. Specifically, the ones that I have been enjoying is um, Jen Campbell did um, reading her friends' favourite books, but she specifically was doing her friends who are authors, and that was really interesting. Um, I know that Gavin at House Training of Gavin does this all the time with like booktubers' favourite books. Everyone's doing it, to be honest with you. Um, and I thought that this would be a really nice way of actually getting to know my friends. Like, it seems weird to be like, get to know my friends better. But kind of, yeah. Like, I think this is a really fun way to get an insight into um, just like the people who I already know that I really like. <laughs> this is the first video. I'm just doing a little intro to how this project is working for me personally. And then uh, the other videos in this series will just be like into it. But um, what I have done is that I've just asked loads of people in my life, like, what are your favourite books? Um, some people, it's been so interesting. Some people were just 100%, this is my favourite book, one answer, that is it. And I really admire that because I cannot do that. Whereas other people are a bit more in my school where it's like, ah, too much choice. And they've given me like a handful of options. What I'm trying to do is um, work through them um, for example, when like a couple of people have given me three or four and I'm kind of going to read the one that either stands out to me the most that I think I'll like or whichever one is just easier for me to get my hands on, to be honest with you. I'm kind of leaving it up to the fates somewhat. Um, what has been so interesting is that I've had a good like, um, not probably not quite 20, but like over 15 people um, for sure. And uh, none of the books that have been mentioned were already on my TBR. Um, oh no, wait, one book was. But of like nearly 20 people, some of whom have given me more than one option, like these are all books that I might have been aware of them, but they were not really on my radar for me to read. So I'm really hoping this is going to be like a fun little um, like a challenge because it gets me reading things that I probably wouldn't have picked up. Um, and what I'm specifically wanting to do is not just read these books and talk about whether I liked them, but try and look at them a bit through the lens of like, why do I think my friend loves this book? Like, can I understand why they love this book, even if I don't? Um, do I get any insights into my friend's tastes? You know, some people who've recommended books to me, I already know their book taste a bit, whereas others, like, this is really, like, the first insight I've had into their book taste. So all of this is to say that I personally am really enjoying this. I'm going to try and do little sets of review videos in threes, because I think that's quite a good amount, because I will inevitably waffle forever about the reads. <laughs> So this is my first set of three and we're going to jump through in time as to like I, I'm recording my thoughts after I read them so that it's all fresh in my brain. So on that note, let's go to past Sophie with her first book. The first person whose favourite book I'm reading for this project is Matt from MCS Books. I will link to his channel down below. I will also link to his blog. I got to know Matt through doing videos and he's been a wonderful, lovely addition to my life. He even posted me a copy of this book so that I could read it. Um, so thank you very much, Matt. Um, the type Before I talk about the book, the types of books that I associate with Matt are um, books in translation. He reads so much in translation. He's given me so many books to read in translation, which is wonderful. Um, I very much associate him with quite character-led books, I think. His other favourite book, The Secrets of Jin Shea by Alma Alexander, I read a few years ago now. And definitely um, I felt like the characters were a really strong aspect of that. I felt really swept up in this like sisterhood aspect of that novel. Um, often quite uh, politically engaged, I would say, definitely. Um, and with this this aspect of novels in translation, very global, um, deeply queer, absolutely, yes. Um, and I have to say, this book hit all of those things. So definitely really delivered the type of novel that I would expect Matt to love. Um, the book I'm talking about is My Tender Matador by Pedro Lamabel, which is translated by Catherine Silver. Pedro Lambel is a Chilean writer. This is um, essentially about a 
failed assassination attempt on Pinochet's life. But we are sort of, our central figure is the Queen of the Corner, who is somewhere around like drag queen, trans woman kind of identity. It's never really pinned down, but I don't think it needs to be. A lot of the interaction with her gender in this, I think, comes from other people. How they refer to her tells you a lot about them, the way that they gender her and that kind of thing. Um, This was utterly gorgeous and beautiful. The writing style, immediately as soon as I started reading this, the writing style was so beautiful, lyrical, poetic, um, very much in a form that is um, very, not stream of consciousness, but very um, flowing. There aren't speech marks. It very much... um, You just flow through the narrative in this lyrical way. Um, Characters talk to each other without speech marks, without line breaks. And all of that really added up to the immersion that I felt reading this. It's a very, very short novel, but I felt really swept up in it. And um, in in like the emotion of it, like this was to me a very emotive led novel. And all of these political aspects to do with Pinochet and the attempted assassination and everything is almost like in the background to this like central story that is between the Queen of the Corner and this young man called Carlos, who is a student who essentially um, the Queen of the Corner lets them use her flat for meetings. And she almost deliberately is like I like doesn't want to know what's happening and really what so much of this is about is this like tension between her and Carlos because they don't know so much information about each other they're able to have this purity of a connection which maybe they would lose if they knew the ins and outs and intricate details of each other's lives so almost like this subterfuge and this political moment is what allows these two people who otherwise would maybe not have anything to do with each other to form this connection and there is so much tension in this between them because um you know the queen of the corner definitely is attracted to carlos but uh is carlos attracted to her like what's happening there um And all of this, so there was was this like delicious atmosphere where you have this tension of this like, you know that there's these political things going on and are they going to be successful and based on history, no. Um, And then there is the tension of the relationship running through and then the tension that just is this moment in Chile and, and how everyone's existence feels so tense and it's like teetering on an edge and everything like that. So I felt like this atmosphere paired with this writing was just delicious and also there's this a really heavy use of metaphor throughout um in a way that almost felt like cinematic at times like in in what I mean by that is like um I felt like I had really vivid snapshots of moments as if it was a film and I don't have everything that comes in between these moments but I have these really vivid scenes that I then go between Um, and I really really enjoyed how vivid that felt to me Um, and I honestly like one of the things I absolutely love the most about this was the character of the Queen of the Corner she is Um, She has such pride in herself at times um, in a way that really I found really interesting. Essentially, like there are a lot of moments in this text where she could be in danger, but her absolute embracing of her identity is and and channeling it is what allows her to like, I don't know, there's a moment when um, her bus is pulled over and she just oozes herself in a way that the the guards are just like go on your way that kind of thing and it's all, all these moments where she's like bucking this like hyper masculine idea of what men are um she finds all of her power when she is absolutely claiming what she is instead and that was just really gorgeous but equally there is a vulnerability to her she has survived some very awful things Um, And it's almost like when she is out, she protects herself by being this proud version of herself. And then you also, because of the perspective, get to see that inner vulnerability, which just made her so compelling to me. And there's a there's a melancholia to her as a result of her experiences. And that tinges the text as well. Whilst you have all this tension and this like, ooh, could anything happen? There's also this melancholia of if anything does happen, what then? Or like, will anything ever happen? And all like, I don't know, just this 
this complexity of layered emotion that I felt as I was reading it I just felt like so enamored with and and again going back to this like bond between the queen of the corner and Carlos um she quotes a lot of like classic song lyrics at him and there is very much this almost like old Hollywood feel to her and it's it's almost sometimes I felt like because of the unknowability of the particular moment they're in and how long it will last and how long they'll even have uh, interacting with each other and everything she like falls back on these cinematic cliches and these Hollywood romanticized ideas and it creates this um this space that allowed them to connect and they can use and queer these these phrases and these things that are like classic romantic Hollywood they can take them and they can use them to create their own sense of intimacy and there's just such a tenderness between them and when they interact and it is it is this like because they are just taking each other as they are they can connect so purely and I just I just found that so beautiful um there are chapters in this that are also from Pinochet's perspective he's only ever referred to as the dictator um and they are peppered throughout um I have seen some reviews of people talking about how they didn't like those because it sort of broke up the narrative for them um I quite enjoyed them because I I felt like they were like very scathing very satirical and like to me they really highlighted like how disconnected this man is from reality and um so I didn't mind them in that way because it, it felt like um almost in the way that the queen is making this deliberately romanticized disconnected space so that the, she can connect with Carlos it's like the dictator has that for himself with how he is um experiencing the world except for like his understanding of what of what is going on in his country is like so absolutely disconnected from reality I don't know um long story short this was a five star read for me. This was such a lovely way to kick off this project. I absolutely loved it. I very much understand why Matt loves this. This feels like such a Matt text to me. And I just, I just had the loveliest of times. <laughs> I have also read a second book for this project, which is Norwegian Wood by Haruki Murakami. This is picked by my friend Carly. Um, my understanding of Carly's book tastes, I have read um, before. God, I've got to remember the name of it. How I Live Now by Meg Rossoff. That is another one of Carly's favourite books that I have read before based on her recommendation, which was, um, I thought it had a really interesting idea. I didn't love everything about the execution of it, but it was a sort of... Um, it's told by a narrator who in her contemporary time is looking back at this um, time that happened. I don't really want to go into too much detail. Essentially, like a big thing happened and then uh, everything is reacting to that. And it, we have this main character who is experiencing the events with an immense sense of immediacy and everything is... Um, it's again, it's very fast paced. It's very stream of consciousness. You're just getting like this, this building tension because you don't really understand what's happening in the world, just that there is this big event and then there is all this fallout and these characters are dealing with it. Um, I felt like it is a book that is probably really great to study. I didn't love everything about the execution, mainly because there were a few things in it that I wanted a bit more explanation for that were just a bit weird. And also there was some incest that I thought was strange. Um, <laughs> but it was an interesting text. Based on that and my understanding of the types of things that Carly writes, because Carly is also a writer, um, I definitely feel like she is a person who is interested in how a text is told, like form and narrative and that kind of thing. She has, um, there is like a darkness to some of the books that she reads, I think, not in like an extreme way, but in like a way of not shying away from these um, dark things, but exploring them and that kind of thing. Um, yes, I did not love Norwegian Wood. <laughs> I have read a Murakami book before, like 10 years ago now, I read Wind Up Bird Chronicle, and I don't remember it super well, but I do remember that it's very surreal, and I read it, like, in between a summer during uni, and I definitely, like, found it really interesting. I think I rated it, like, four stars on Goodreads. Um, this was very different to that, and... That was interesting because I knew of Norwegian Wood going in. I didn't know what it was about. So if I was to describe to you what Norwegian Wood is as like a plot setup, I would say that we are following this guy 
um, while he is at university and he's sort of just his interactions with some people and that kind of thing. So in contrast to Wine at Bird Chronicle, which I remember is this like surreal, sprawling, like it starts with like a man who's looking for his missing cat and then you end up in some wild places. This one is very different, which is extremely interesting to compare. Um, and I gather that this Norwegian wood is like abnormal for Murakami and the Wind Up Bird Chronicle is maybe a bit more accurate to the types of books he normally writes. And that is an interesting thing to, to, to know now. <laughs> I definitely felt like there were moments of really beautiful writing in this. There were there were moments of descriptions of things where I was like, oh, that's a lovely phrasing. That's a really nice way of referring to that. I didn't like hate it. It's just, I think I had a thought at like 70% the way through. I was like, when is the plot going to happen? <laughs> And I wonder if that's because of my previous experience with Murakami. I wasn't sure if there were, we were going to hit a point and then like surrealism was going to happen, but we don't. This was very much like a text where we are just rooted in this guy and in his interactions with a number of other people. He has um, one, his closest friend from when he was younger um, committed suicide and... Um, that friend's girlfriend he meets up with again and they go for these walks. So she's a character that he's interacting with. There is another girl who he um, meets on his course who is going through some things and they have these interactions. Um, and it's very much like a quiet novel in that way in that it is just this guy living his life and these interactions he has with these women and that kind of thing. I think where I struggled most is sort of connecting to character I think because for me um well actually where I struggled most is that I don't like the way that the women are written in this book <laughs> and I don't know if this is controversial because this is a very loved book this is Harry Styles's favorite book that's the only other thing I knew about this before I read it I was like Carly loves it Harry Styles loves it um I don't like the way women are written in this book I felt like every woman who was present in the text as an actual character existed just to have sexual interactions with our main character and then tell him how amazing he was. Um, they felt very one-dimensional to me and I wondered earlier on if it was going to be a case of like subverting because they felt very manic pixie dream girl to me and I wondered earlier on if it was going to be a case that we were going to subvert that and maybe it was going to be like this is how our narrator has been interpreting it but maybe we'll hit a point where we like recognize that these are people with much more complex existences and occasionally like at the edges like I did feel like that it's just the way that it ended up being is it just felt like these women just like exist like I, I don't know I felt like an emotionlessness from our narrator I think and so he would come out with like oh well, I, I'm in love with her and I'd be like I didn't know you felt anything for this person and so I really struggled with connecting to the characters I think and that is difficult when it is a novel that is very quiet narratively when you look at like plot wise what happens like it is very much if you're not connected to those characters like it is just like uh, things happen um you know and so I think that's what I struggled with the most there were little elements in this that I really enjoyed and there were little themes so it is named after a Beatles song and there are a few moments of music being present that I did enjoy I think I thought that music would be more present in it because I do like I really like narratives that really like connect with music like one of my best books of last year was Do Not Say We Have Nothing by Madeleine Tien which music and the importance of music runs throughout that so strongly and I really loved that so again I wonder if that's a little bit expectation reality is because I knew it was named after this song I thought there would be a bit more presence of music throughout it um but I don't I don't think it is a poorly written book I think it is well written um I didn't dislike um the actual reading experience of it I think I just felt frustrated at times because well not even frustrated just a bit bemused sometimes I think you know when I don't know I don't I don't this is what I was didn't think about when I started this project is what would happen if I don't like the books that are my friend's favorite books um which is it's like absolutely fine like it's not a commentary on them as a people like we all engage with media differently and connect to things differently it's just my thinking had been I love these people I'm interested to see what they love and 
I would I'm really I haven't talked to my friend about it yet because I haven't seen her since um and I'm really interested to chat with her about why she loves this book and to hear about it because for example there are novels which you can just read at the perfect moment and then they grip you and they sum up a particular time of your life or there were discussions in this um because suicide is present throughout and because there are uh, mental health struggles and that kind of thing in this so there are discussions to do with like um living and like that kind of thing so I, I wonder if something like that is is also like what would really draw a person to this novel um so yeah it's it's not a novel that I'm like how could anyone like this it's terrible I don't think that I just given the reputation that this book has and given the reading experience I had of it I felt like there was a bit of a discrepancy and that's why I'm really interested to find out what it is about it that my friend loves so much because I don't I don't immediately know (laughs) and but that's why this is interesting is part of it is not just Um, do I like this book but part of it is thinking about why my friend likes this book and therefore I'm hoping to get like a little like understanding of my friends through it and see what are their like reading priorities what are things that like make them light up that kind of thing Um, but yeah an interesting contrast between books one and two. Third book that I have read for this particular first video is my friend Miriam's favourite book And that when I think of Miriam, the types of book I think about are, when it comes to fiction, very, um, like, emotion-led books, if that makes sense. So um, I would associate that sort of vibe with with more, like, character-led books. But that's not to say that she doesn't also really like plot-led books at all. It's just when I think of a classic Miriam book in my brain, I think of, like, an evocative, emotion-led title that um often because Miriam one thing I really like about Miriam hi Miriam (laughs) if you're watching one thing I really like about you is um she has a background in art history but also her like current um research areas are more like modern contemporary culture and that kind of thing so I think she has this really interesting perspective that is like um looking at current things but with an awareness of the past and how those influence I don't know I don't know if that really makes sense but um I think she has she brings like a really interesting perspective to what she reads so the book that she recommended to me and she actually gave me two books but I picked this one because I knew that this is her favorite book it's just the other one was just in case I couldn't find an English translation um, but this is Agnes by Peter Stamm. This is translated by Michael Hoffman. I have known for years that this is Miriam's favourite book and I'm really pleased to have finally read it. I enjoyed this. This is um, the blurb. I will just read you like the first two sentences from the blurb, which is, write a story about me, Agnes said to her lover, so I know what you think of me. So he started to write the story of everything that had happened to them from the moment they met. And when I first started this book, um, it's very quick read. It's super small. Um, And I've read it in like literally an evening. um, And it opens with sort of like the narrator, who is this man. We don't know his name. um, And he describes the first time he meets Agnes. And then they start a relationship. And then Agnes says this like, write about me. And then he starts writing about them and their relationship. And right at the start, the way that he was like writing about Agnes, in my little mind, I was like, hmm, is this, are we going to verge into like, and I know I already said this with Murakami, but like, Manic Pixie Dream Girl territory, like the way that he was writing about this woman. And then it was like, of course not. That's not the point. But like, what is happening that was so interesting for this, for me, was that there is this real like awareness of the construction of narrative. So like, yes, this first meeting with Agnes is given to you in a way that is very like idealized, romanticized and that kind of thing. But what I found really interesting as this novel progresses is that because he starts writing this version of their relationship for her, you get almost like a tension between the version of their relationship that he is writing and then the reality of what their relationship is. So um, initially it just is a way of um, like, almost like play 
between them. Like he might write like, oh, we're going to go to this place and Agnes wears this outfit. And so then Agnes wears the outfit and they go to the place. Um, and it starts off very playful in that way. But then as this relationship progresses and they come up against like relationship problems and things like that, um, the gap between the reality and this construction grows and it really highlights like where they're at in their actual relationship when you look at this idealized version and like this idealized version of Agnes that shows you almost like what he would like her to be and then the reality of who she is is more complex than that and that's part of the reason why they are going there's this void is growing between reality and construction is because she is a real person who is different to this narrative idealized version of her um and there's elements of like does he know that is is this version like what he would like her to be you know all of that kind of thing that was really interesting this this awareness of construction and then when you have awareness of construction it then may there are moments in this that then make me question how much is being said like because this narrative is being narrated by him um and he's telling you about constructing this narrative about them it also then makes me question the narrative that is being created by him you know so there is very much this like uh a, in self-aware construction of narrative kind of thing that i personally found really interesting the ending i won't spoil it all i will say is that there is a um an openness to the ending in that you don't get all the answers and how this ended made me really like be like oh I'm gonna have to think about this for a while because uh it sort of ended in a way where I felt like you're being presented with something and it's for you to really identify what you think has happened like what is the reality here um and what what I found really funny when I was reading this is I enjoyed this and uh I gave it I think I gave it a four star um and then I finished it and I was thinking about it to review for this and I was like even if I had disliked this this is such a Miriam book and like you know like I get why it's her favorite book because I read this and I feel her in it there was a moment in it that I really loved where um they go to a museum and they're looking at art and discussing his writing because he is also he is actually a writer in this like that is his profession um and they talk about writing happiness and he's saying about how happiness is really hard to write i think if i'm remembering it right and agnes talks about how it's like pontalism and it's like lots of little things lots of little dots and then you have to look at it from far away to see the big picture like that's what happiness is and I loved that I was like love this metaphor yes and I was I read it and I was like I know why Miriam likes this this is so Miriam to me as a book to sort of like round off this first three I really enjoyed this one not just because I enjoyed reading it and I enjoyed thinking about it but it really drove home to me sort of the point of this project, which is like reading books and being like, oh yeah, this is this person. I get it. I get why this is their favorite book. I both get it and get the insight into that person, you know? Or, you know, sometimes I know my friends, but when I come and I read their favorite books and I'm really spending time thinking about them, it may be, I think it's making me sort of actually verbalize things that I know about them that maybe I haven't like verbalized to myself before. Uh, not to like make it sound like super dramatic. It's just, it is, it is making me think about my friends as people and what they like in media and who they are and that kind of thing. Those are the first three books that I have read for this. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you have read any of these, please do leave a comment down below. Um, or if you'd like to read any, just let me know your thoughts. All of that jazz. I uh, already know where I'm going to go next with this project. I have an idea of the next three books I think that I'm going to focus on. I'm trying to do like one to two books a month. So then by the end of the year, I might have managed to read a book from everyone who has contributed. Uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but so far, this is off to a really fun start. 
Uh, if you would like to let me know your favorite book, like, please do. I think I'm just going to, like, keep the list on my phone and just add to it. And then I'll just, like, carry on doing this for as long as I fancy reading the books. But it is getting me to read stuff that I had not previously considered reading. So anyway, I feel like I'm waffling with enthusiasm. So I will draw this to a close and I will say, uh, I hope you're having a nice day. Hope you're reading great books. And I will see you next time for something different.